are uh, uh, ca uh, ca uh, cardamom and turmeric. Uh, this is uh, it's a tropical plant. Uh, it requires, I think Chris mentioned, requires tropical condition to be able to get mature ginger. So if you are planning to have uh, mature ginger, like what you see at your farmer's market, you need nine to 11 months to be able to, from the time that you plant your seed, peas, until the time you harvest, you need that length of time. Uh, is that possible to do it in here? Well, we do it for our seeds uh, because we rely on our, our own seed. Charles does it all the time. We have tunnel within the tunnel for our seeds. And if you have, you have a tunnel, and then inside of that, we have another tunnel. And then we cover that again with, uh, with the uh, row, row covers. And then inside of that, we put sometimes heaters to be able to, to take that product all the way to, to the time of maturity. So it's a tropical plant. And then uh, is the new thing that I wanted to, to do there, kind of looking at this systematically. Uh, it's the sustainable ginger production, that if you want to grow it year after year for the next 20 years, you really need to look in, looking at this element. So look, I've been involved with ginger for the last probably 25 years, not, lo not longer than Jim, because last time he told me he's been involved for 30 years. But, and I've seen countries after countries going down because it's really exciting. It's not complicated to grow it. Hawaii was the leading, I think Jim mentioned and a few other people mentioned Hawaii, they had the best ginger production possible. All of their ginger used to go to Hong Kong and Japan as premium product. They went down because of diseases. So it's really important if you want to do this year after year for the next 10 years, 15 years, you need to look at this from a sustainable perspective. Sustainable pers perspective is market. Don't jump in there and plant a bunch of ginger because it costs at least $8 a pound to buy the seed. If you buy it from Hawaii, if you buy the plant from us, it costs $4 a plant. So it has a required investment. So do your homework about marketing. You have somebody to sell it to. And then seed piece selection is really the heart of this whole operation. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And then you need to have mature, disease-free <laughs> seed pieces with minimum of two ounces. Now, the, the, there are people that they may argue with me about this, uh, these things, but, uh, uh, but that's the experience that we've had. Really, you need to have a good seed piece, the size, and two eyes to be able to have that. It needs to be clean and disease free. Uh, many of you have gone to your local supermarket, bought a piece of ginger, took it home. I don't know. Some of you have had luck with it, some of you have not. You know, there are stories out there that are sometimes disappointing. So, fresh looking, disease free is really, really critical. And disease management is really, really cr critical. So, if you grow it in the high tunnel, in your pots, you see um, problem with plants. Take them out immediately because most likely you have what they call uh, a bacteria wilt, which is the most important problem of ginger. Take it out. And our good friend Bill Cox had, can tell you all about that with his experiment. So it's disease management is very, very critical. And then the other thing is if you want to have ginger, well, like what you see on the table, uh, Richard Harris has some, and then Michael Clark, and we have some in there. You know, those big 10 pound, 13 pound ginger, if you want to have those, you've got to feed them. On the other hand, what they call ginger is a heavy feeder. The more you feed it, the better crop you get. So keep that in mind. Don't be stingy uh, with, uh, with feeding and providing nutrition and fertilizer to your ginger. Extremely, extremely important. And then, uh, because it depletes the soil very, uh, very quickly. And then, uh, mounding is important. Because as the ginger grows, I have a picture that I show as we move uh, forward. As the ginger rhizome grows, it comes up. It doesn't go down. It doesn't, you know, it runs on the side and it comes up. So if you don't mound it maybe a couple of times a year, you're going to have a bunch of green ginger. It's not bad, but the presentation is important. You wouldn't be able to sell green ginger at the market. So you've got to be mindful of that. And then plant spacing is important because that whole idea of disease, you don't want to put a bunch of, I know um, 
as my uh, as uh, Chris Oliver says, uh, high tunnel is a really expensive real estate. But you don't want to be stingy with that. You want to open it up enough between rows and between plants to be able to have air circulation in there so you would reduce foliar, foliar diseases. So uh, we are suggesting plants spacing three feet between rows and two feet between plants in your high tunnel. Shade is really, really, really important. I don't know if there is anybody outside from Florida or Carolina there are lots of folks out there that are talking about growing these acres after acres because they've heard the good news of being able to make money. In Florida, you would be able to grow it in the field. But it's really, really important that uh, ginger likes 30% shade. 30% shade. But that plastic that you have on your high tunnel is adequate. It's probably 25 to 30% shade. You don't need to be worried about that in the uh, high tunnel. But if you're growing it in the field, you need to have to provide it inner copy with other things. I have some pictures I'll show you. And then rotation, 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 like all other crops, because it's disease development. If you have that bacteria in the soil, then you're stuck with it and you are going to cause a lot of trouble. So don't plant ginger on the same spot year after year after year. Uh, use cover crop, rotate it, and there are lots of really good recipes in Virginia for that whole idea of rotation. Okay? It's Photoperiod sensitive. So that means it's a, it's a big word, but what really it means, the foliage development of the ginger needs to be in the spring and summer. So if you start growing ginger in the fall, start your seed production in the fall, you're going to get ginger, but very, very small, one fifth or one tenth. That whole ginger plant, that beautiful top, really needs sunlight and that long days to be able to produce good rhizome. And then when we get to the fall, that whole development of rhizome occurs in short days. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't plant ginger in the fall. Ginger rhizome seed. These are some examples that we have. This is actually a picture from Hawaii. Paul uh, Hepperly uh, from the University of Hawaii that uh, he has a publication. This is a good example of the size and eyes and the cleanness and shininess of, of those of the seeds. And then what, because when we prepare our seed, we do a lot of cutting. So let's say if you go in there and buy a few seeds from your supermarket, a few seeds from Rafi, a few seeds from Bill Cox, you bring them all together. And if mine is infected with bacteria, well, then use that knife to do the cutting. And then you cut the, the good stuff, and then you're going to have problem all over. So you just got to make sure you clean that knife or whatever pruner, whatever you use to be able to cut and prepare your, uh, your rhizomes. And then we use lots of bleach. Charles, at the during the time that we have, we have lots of Clorox and bleach going on in our thing to be able to disinfect our, our uh, seed pieces. This is our seed. These are what, what Charles and David and Sam, they prepare at, at our farm. We want to make sure we start with a good, solid seed. So there are, actually there, there are a couple of publications out there that actually correlation between size of seeds and the rhizome. So if you want to argue with me, that's fine. If you want to do it differently, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go uh, arguing with you about that. But this is how we start our production. Again, you want to make sure the seed that you have on the table, most likely they are not mature. They need to uh, go beyond baby, baby ginger stage. You want to make sure that it's mature. So that's a seed that we have in there. We prepare our one gallon pots. This is tradition, how we have done it. On the annual basis, we probably produce between 500 to 600. David, that's the right number, right? 500, 600 plants, ginger plants? We, yeah, we pr produce five to 600 plants just to make it available to our growers because we know if, in order to be able to get this moving forward, we want to make sure growers have access to good, solid sources of plants which are disease-free. So uh, we prepare one gallon pots and then uh, there's a mix, we put it in there and then that, um, this is uh, obviously, I put it in there so you could take a look at it. This is two, three deep, inches deep and then covered, we keep it in, uh, in our greenhouses uh, with probably 65, uh, seven, maybe 75 degrees. You need to keep it warm, otherwise it sits in there because you need to, that thing to sprout. We do that in January. 
in January, end of December, Charles and, De and uh, David and Sam just get out there and prepare our seats. So, and that's what you see in there. These are our one gallon in um, mid-April. Uh, there isn't really much you need to do. Just make sure it sprouts. And we get a bunch of bad plants, which throw them away. And so, which is really interesting, that whole process of being able to transplant. Because if you plant the seeds, because in other countries they plant the seeds, if a seed is infected and you have bad plants, it just goes in the field. So this is the advantage of having transplanting this, this uh, um, the, the ginger. Again, I want to share with you this whole idea of, because this has to be economical in terms of production. So if I go in there and spend $4 to buy a plant, or pay $8 to buy seeds, and I end up selling it $3 a pound, which may end up being in three, four, five years, because as a production, here we are, 100 people this year, 100 people last year. If you have in five years, we've got 700 growers in Virginia, every one of them growing tons of ginger, then they're not going to stay $10 a pound. I wish they'd, it, it, it would, but that's unlikely. So it's, at some point, it's going to stabilize itself, supply and demand. But obviously, uh, Bill Cox is at it, promoting it day and night, different forms, has just great networking ability to be able to put it on the map in a different form, in different ways, and promoting it, which is absolutely essential. But long term, think about it in terms of something that stabilizes itself. And now, are we going to pay $4 for a plant and sell it? $8 or $10 after going through all that process? Unlikely. So we need to come up with this whole idea of mass production of seed. So here's the story. Uh, these are a couple of years ago, we, we brought in, there is a tissue culture, uh, tissue culture laboratory in Apopka, Florida. They are growing, they gave us kindly, they provided some tissue culture plant and we planted them last year. A few of you probably were uh, present when we harvested. They were not marketable, <laughs> marketable ginger. So, and then we took those ginger. Uh, Charles called them uh, chicken. What did you call them, Charles? Chicken feed. Chicken feed. Chicken feed. They were just really, really small. So he planted those rhizomes. I have not. I wanted me to be surprised and you to be surprised, positive or negatively, we're gonna go ahead and harvest a few of those tissue culture, second year tissue culture plant. On the other hand, we brought tissue culture plant to our farm, we planted it, it wasn't marketable, we took some of those rhizomes, planted it again, we'll see how it goes this year. I'll share that good or bad news with you today. So, but anyway, so again, uh, but there are effort in India, uh, they are, actually try to get smaller pieces of rhizome, which is really interesting. And because they have mass production of it, and then they take the plug. Many of you have grown a strawberry or transplant a vegetable. They just, you take this plug and you plant it. You don't need to be worried about that. In fact, that picture came to me at 10 o'clock. I desperately called uh, Alison last night. I said, Alison, please send me, because there is a lady actually Cutting, this is a flat of a ginger. Last year was sold in Maryland, and I have the farm's information. So there are a lot of activity going on, and I know there is an individual here that they are in the process of that tissue culture process. So I think it's important for us to be able to take this whole thing to the next level so we have a, an effective and efficient way to produce this clean sources of seed. Michael Clark has his own way of doing it, he's experimenting. As an engineer, we, who he is, he's gonna share some of his thoughts with you uh, uh, later on. But this is what I was talking about. This is the ginger, and these are all tissue culture plant last year. A few of you saw this thing, and that's the, that's the tissue culture plant we planted, and this is a bunch of really chicken feet, that Charles called them, uh, that we got last year, so. But anyway. So this is how we do it. Although Charles has modified this, uh, he has his own way of doing this, and I respect that very much, but we use a lot of mushroom compost. It really has shown us uh, uh, that it's a really, really effective um, product to use. We use a lot of mushroom compost, and then 
uh, when, I, when we prepared the, the furrow for our planting, we kind of fill it up with, uh, with mushroom compost. And the area that we want to plant, we usually, I use uh, triple superphosphate. That has been really effective. And then I use, we use, a, uh, there is a product called, it's a poultry manure fertilizer, 323's quick start. That we get it from one of the uh, fertilizer, uh, uh, agri supplies in, uh, in Winsboro, Virginia. It's an organic product. We use that one at the beginning. So, and then we set up our plants as for the right distance, and this is the mushroom compost. We use tons of this every year in our production. And then we set up our irrigation system. This is what we do in, probably you need to be patient with it. You don't get out there too early because April still, we get some cold coming in and they could really slow down the plant. Just probably until mid end of April or, or probably mid the uh, first week of, of May, okay? That's our plant in, uh, in May. Uh, in August, they have really good growth on them. And this is in September. Uh, many of you know Charles, Charlie Maloney. Uh, Charlie Maloney, actually he's not a, he's not a tall guy. So. <laughs> 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 he's, he's a great guy, but he's not the tallest guy. <laughs> but uh, great, great growers, we, we love Charlie. And uh, actually, in fact, he was one of the first that started growing ginger with us. Uh, he does a great job, but anyway. And then uh, fertilizer. Fertilizer, here, here's the recipe, quick recipe. There, is, there are some really good information in there. Uh, folks will send you all of this. I think Ms. Molly Klein have indicated or she's going to, but if you really want the presentation, all of this presentation, we're going to uh, email them to you. They're gonna be on videos, and so you don't have to be worried about taking notes. Just listen to the story. Uh, but this is a good source for fertilizer. But what the, the simple recipe is at the beginning of the season, when you plant those transplants, feed them a lot of fertilizer and uh, a lot of nitrogen because you want that top to grow. And then when you get July, August, September, just feed them a lot of potassium to be able to lift that to increase those. And we do it all the time, constantly. We're feeding, we're feeding our ginger because we want to have those. Last year, I think ginger, uh, Char, two years ago, or three years ago, he had a ginger who was, uh, pure rhizome was 18 and a half pounds. So it just, it's possible to get huge, huge uh, production and yield from, from ginger if you're willing to invest in terms of feeding and, and management part of it. Uh, this is mounding. You see the, you see the, this is, you can't, uh, I'm sure, uh, um, uh, Edward Thompson, hesitate to buy that or uh, or Molly Harrison they would they would say well this is this is not really good quality ginger you need to do that mounding what you do because when you have them in the greenhouse they grow so much when you go in there you see there's so much you can't see that you've got to walk in there open up the top and just look down to see if they are coming out and then have a bucket and just pour mulch on it or uh, soil whatever media you have just make sure you cover those those uh, your ginger. Uh, this is our uh, Sam uh, Sam Williams, and just uh, with with uh, this is a new presentation that we're doing it. Is we leave a little bit of, of that. Uh, the idea actually was given to us by Michael Clark, the first time many years ago. We were cutting it, cutting the whole things from the from the uh, from here, and then he came up with the idea. But it's actually really interesting because it's so vulnerable as baby ginger. It loses, uh, it has a lot of water, doesn't have much fiber to hold that water. So actually leaving that green piece not only helps the presentation of the product, but also the, the post-harvest aspects of it. So, we, and if you're a grower, adds a little bit more weight to, to that, to that pro product, going to, which, is, which is always a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, um, we have very little um, insect problem, but a couple of years ago, I started seeing this army work and just gets on the plants in the fall and then makes the tunnel, goes down and, oops, excuse me, goes in there and causes, uh, causes a tunnel, and then you see some problem on, the, on your, your rhizome. Not very critical, just but be aware of that. A, rise, um, a leaf spot. If we are beginning to see it, and some year we see it more than other. Last year we had it, it was more severe than this year. Uh, we sprayed uh, with a fungicide, 
uh, when we see it, and that will take care of it. Uh, but if it's not too severe, you don't need to be need to be worried about that. It's not very critical because because again, if it's going to take a lot of time, 20, 25 years, producing these things at our place to be able to really build up diseases and insects. Um, diseases, bacteria wilt, bacteria wilt, bacteria wilt. It's a huge problem uh, that we have. It spreads by if you walk uh, with your shoes, with your tools, with uh, everything that you do with your hands, with somebody comes in there and visits. So that is the reason in many other countries, the farmers, what they actually begin to have is huge investment. What they do, they isolate their seed source. If you are a farmer who wants to grow part of your tunnel for your seed, uh, you got to isolate it. Uh, don't let people get there. Close it by and minimize the movement of people. Uh, but we can't do it. I keep telling Charles, you got to isolate this thing. But as a public institution, we are open for people to come and visit. Uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's really, really important for a bacteria wheel to be able to isolate your sources of seed. Um, but anyway, so just let me move on. And this is a way that actually there's a, there's a publication in there, I think from Hawaii. Uh, ooze, you could probably, add, if you are not sure about your ginger seed piece having a um, problem or uh, a bacterial wilt problem, you just cut the surface and put it in, put it in water and then you see this stem. That's an indication as a bad seed. Get rid of it, don't plant it. Uh, diseases, bacteria, soft rot, irvinia, uh, Xanthosoma, leaf blight, Fusarium, Pythium sulfurate, and this is an example uh, that we've had. This is actually from our own farm here at Randolph Farm, uh, a Fusarium uh, problem. So, and then one of the things that is really becoming problematic for me, I want to go back to show you this. This is actually, we, uh, we harvest this the day before yesterday, and Charles had it in a box in our greenhouse. I went in there and I saw alarm me, and that's limited, root not limited. Uh, so, you, Crocs, you got to be careful with that. It really is, takes over and causes problems. That's the reason you don't want to go back and plant over and over. Uh, this is very concerning. I know it by experience, but I'm hoping to be able to, David, uh, usually take sample and send it to the lab. We want to make sure that, yes, it is root not limited, but pretty, pretty sure it is. And then what it does eventually to the ginger, it just really makes it bad, bad quality ginger. Okay? Now, shade. Um, again, as I say, if you're planting in, a, in, a, in, the, in your high tunnel, don't worry about it. You're okay with 30% shade, but if you are not, this is actually, you could intercrop it with, uh, with, uh, with corn, makes a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, shade. And then this is actually a picture that I just took from Myanmar. They planted with pigeon pea. Beautiful. And then when you walk, you really could see the disease differences in terms of the expression of the cleanness of the plant, particularly the leaf spot. Remember what I told you about the leaf spot? When you have that shade, it provides good protection for leaf spot. So that is something that you may want to consider. Now, this is a local knowledge. Actually, that's a picture that I took from. Bill was asking me, because this is his seventh year that with, uh, with, uh, in, uh, with the India, uh, they come to these things, and this morning he was asking me, do you have anything new that I can learn to do? <laughs> this is, uh, I thought, well, I've got a few more slides. But otherwise, the bulk of it is what we do every year. But this is actually what I call local knowledge, because when you go international, even when I step out to go to other places, when I go to Bill's or Michael's places, there are always something new to learn. If you're willing to really, you know, these are really simple farmers that I went there, and I, and I went there, in there as an ginger expert, but I wanted to help them. But that wasn't the case. The case was, okay, I'm here to learn from you. When you humble yourself, you know, you're willing to make it you know, a mutual learning process. Great things could happen. So they taught me the way they grow things, which is really interesting. One thing that, that I learned from them, and oops, excuse me, which is interesting. You see, this is the furrow that they have. Look at the position of the, of the seeds, that they put their seeds in there. And for the longest time, I was there three weeks, I was wondering, why do you do that? And nobody was able to really tell the reason, the real reason why they do that. And what also they do, they do, this is straw, a rice straw that they put in there, 
produces organic matter over time and also control weeds, which is a big problem in their case. But so, but anyway, the stories of this is puzzled me. Why do you plant that, you know, you don't f flatly put it on the ground as we do all the time. But uh, so uh, then, so this is, this is, I just want to share you, when we harvest, we have the seed. But what they do, when the plant grows, they plant their seed vertical, and then when they go in there, and they go in there and remove this seed piece. They go in there and actually break it. So when I learned that they are breaking it all, I was pr protesting. No, don't do that, because uh, the, that's a mother seed. You still, the, 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 the plant still needs that source. And then if you op break that, uh, you, you make it vulnerable to diseases, because that wound in, under, the, under the soil becomes vulnerable and could infect. But the reason they do that, they do that in probably uh, June. There's no ginger in the market. Mm -hmm. The prices of ginger is really high. So they go in there, it's very clever. So they go in there and break that piece of ginger and they have a thousand more ginger to sell. And they're based on their experiences, uh, you know, obviously have had has had work with them uh, quite lovely. So, uh, but, so I was really curious about that, would that work? So I came back and we set up an experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently for ne next year. But I, with, with, with Charles and David, we decided, well, let's set up an experiment. So we planted our things, and this is uh, the experiment that we had six rows. So we decided to take the pot and remove that seed. Uh, so that's the seed piece. Charles is uh, removing that. That's the seed piece that I'm going to put aside. And then, uh, if you are a farmer and you spend a thousand, a thousand dollars, or no, maybe hundred, hundred pounds, and then you take that hundred pound seeds back, and uh, and being able to sell it when there is no market, locally grown market, locally local ginger, it could be a little bit of money. But let's continue with the story. So you plant that, and then. I wanted to look at the data. So this data that I have is not final. So I, I want to make sure that this is very pre preliminary data that we took a bunch of. So these are, these are what we call de-seeded. These are the weight of plant that we harvested. And the average was 8.1. And this is uh, seed not removed. The average of it is 10.9. Obviously, there are some differences. but. It's not final. I just, you are the first audience. I was excited. I want to share that with you today. And then the other things that I was worried about, remember diseases? So I went in there and we started looking at, uh, looking at number of, this is actually by observation, number of plants that they show the symptom of bacterial wilt. So when you had uh, in those, the, of the 60 plants that we had, we deceded. Uh, eight of them showed sign of bacteria growth, and with seeded one, we had, we had more, which is really interesting. I just wanted to share that with you very quickly. But again, I'm hoping to be able to finish with the, with the whole data, and next year we could probably present it uh, better. But that's something just to, to, to remember and to keep in mind. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in 2014, we just took some sample. We've had uh, the average of our probably of our uh, yield per plant is between seven, six to seven pounds. And then we get ginger that are 13, 14, 15. So it's just, uh, it has again, lots and lots of potential for good quality ginger. So if you decide you wanted to, I talk about maturing these things and getting, a, getting, a, getting your own seed. Uh, this is with, uh, with, with Chris Bonner, we had a second tunnel, and this is probably end of January. This is a few years ago. Uh, that we actually put another high tunnel in there, and then we let that thing mature. And when it starts maturing, the plant turns yellow, just going down. Well, that's the time that we know that our seeds are, are mature. And then we, again, yeah, this is, uh, this is what, what I was talking about, that tunnel within the, within the tunnel. And these are uh, some of the samples of, that we have with uh, the chars. Those are the, the, the plant, uh, the seeds that we have, uh, we have uh, so I want to quickly go through to make, I think there are lots of excitement of the talk, but this is actually 
And my wife put this together. She was, she was she's writing a grant, and I said, can I use this? Sure. Uh, uh, but anyway, so this is the 223% uh, increase from 2007 to 2015 with, uh, with turmeric, annual import of turmeric. Folks, turmeric is, I think Dr. Shobat mentioned, and other, uh, I think Jim mentioned, that there are lots and lots of potential with turmeric. But um, it's a tropical plant also from the same family of ginger. And it takes a good seven to ten to eight months, the ten months to be able to get mature ginger. But uh, but um, I, I think there is no reason to go on with this. But this is how I grow exactly like ginger. But the difference, the good news is, when you go to your local Indian store or Chinese store or a specialty store and buy that piece of turmeric, mature turmeric, the likelihood for that to be a good piece of seed piece is high. It's not like ginger. Our experience is, so don't worry about it, go in there and get that. But it takes forever, at least uh, in our case. Uh, Michael probably would have a different recipe for that, but it really takes forever to be able to sprout that. So do buy that those seed pieces way before. Look, we planted them in January. In July, we were able to plant them. So it, it takes forever to sprout. And I'm sure Richard would have a different recipe for that. I would share with us. Again, uh, the same recipe. We use a lot of, lot of mushroom compost. Uh, that's the September. That's the most beautiful flowers. If you get lucky and have a few other flowers, incredible. Uh, we do intercrop them because, as I said, real estate uh, uh, with, uh, with our high tunnel, we intercrop them. That's a, that's a fuzzy kiwi that we planted with that. And, uh, and then uh, this, is, uh, this is the, the mature turmeric that we harvest. We can continue keeping it warm probably until end of December, January, uh, before we start harvesting it. But that's, the, that's, uh, that's at this time of the year that chars harvest and we, we market that. Um, again, uh, this is how we started presenting it because it's really, really difficult to be able to get those fingers. Uh, it takes a lot of time if you pay $10 for somebody an hour to do it. So we have kind of trying to present it to the market that, yes, we got to do it this way. And it seemed like there, are, there is acceptance in the market mm -hmm. to doing it. Uh, our yield is not as high yielding. Uh, uh, again, based on a lot of growers experience, it's not a high yielding product. So I, I could claim that 10 pound average uh, per ginger, but if you get five pounds uh, per average of turmeric, I think you'll be, you'll be very happy. Again, uh, as part of institution and every one of you who are growing these things, if you really want to continue seeing increase in the pr production and consumption, you need to be part of the, the army of educators. You really need to get out there and educate people about how to do this, how to consume it, different recipes, and so on. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully we'll talk about this as we go. Thank you very much. <laughs>